And this isn't a complete list of every single feature and upgrade. There's over 250 different enhancements in there. We'd never get through them all. And frankly, you've got better things to be doing with your time because some of these are very, very specific and niche. But this is our pick based on the conversations that our team are having with our customer base dotted around uh, the UK, Europe and further afield and understanding the types of challenges that you have, the types of things that Netscaler can do to overcome those challenges and really the key features that people are talking about at the moment. Now, if you want to dig down into individual ones, you'll see that we'll be having some specific essential guides around specific topics in due course, or by all means, reach out to the Cloud DNA team and we'll fill in the blanks of anything that you find particularly relevant or useful or you want to investigate further. But I'm going to start this time with just some of the nice to haves. This isn't the really big feature set kind of stuff. This is just some of the things that we found that folks are talking about and that the team here are quite interested in and that indeed that our customer base are telling us is useful in the real world. So nice kind of things to have. In the first instance, there's some uh, UI en enhancements. So for those of you who get hands on and maybe you've got Netscaler already, maybe you're a long way back and you need to really think about upgrading. Jack, you know who you are. You need to come away from that old school Java front end because it's just making your life harder than it needs to be. So there's some really cool GUI enhancements. It's had another little revamp and a little freshen up in there, but it's super, super quick now. HTML5 based, super, super quick. Uh, it's got a nice little fun uh, function in there to search. So just like you would do on Google when you're trying to find a particular object, a particular V server, you're trying to find some particular particular component of your configuration, uh, then that little search function pops up and gives you a really nice way of finding that. And there's a little reminder to remind you you haven't actually saved the configuration that you have in your web browser as well. Nice, nice little features to have. Nothing too crazy, nothing too clever, but really worth having. Now, for those of you who have Microsoft Direct Access, uh, there's an always on feature that's uh, developed uh, in, or being delivered in 11.1. And this allows us to have an automatic VPN tunnel with no manual intervention on there. And this is something that Netscaler now supports. There is a blog post from Citrix about Microsoft, Microsoft Direct Access. Of all the vendors, you should be able to pronounce Microsoft will probably be one of them. But these guys have, uh, the guys in the blog have had a little bit of a deep dive around that, looking at the different access scenarios and the different use cases for Microsoft DA. So check it out. It's worth having a look at. For those who are on a super fresh edition of Zen Apps at desktop and you're using Framehawk, Netscaler now supports Framehawk, and that's a good thing. Uh, so those who are using particularly poor network services, Framehawk can have quite a significant impact on that. GSLB zone preference is something that our larger organization customers have told us they like quite a lot as well. And if you imagine this kind of concept is if we've got a, a roaming traveler, somebody that's based in the UK and then goes over to the US for business, GSLB, the global server load balancing feature, may well have proximity load balancing configured on it. And the concept of that is very simple, just for those who are not familiar. It's to enable us to be able to say, I'm closest geographically to a certain data center, so I'm going to push my user connection to that data center. The net effect is that the implications of latency and so on are going to be reduced and the user experience will be better, and that's what we're always after. The challenge with that, however, is in a Zen Apple Zen desktop environment, although the user may well be closer to that particular data center, they may not have all of their data and services in that location. And the net effect of that is that really they can't do all the things they need to do. So we can set up some zone preferences in there. Now, again, this isn't massive, but these are really, really useful features that Citrix is listening to the audience, listening to the marketplace and listening to their customers and saying, OK, all right, we'll bake that in. So 11.1, it's in the box. And uh, we encourage you to go and have a play with that. If you're in a larger environment, uh, we're talking to some customers about putting that into production already. Uh, SNI, for those of you who are living the dream with secure socket layer and uh, looking at server name indication, uh, well, this allows the browser or the client and the server supporting SNI to connect multiple certificates from multiple domain names to one IP address. Now, if you're not too technical, that's not really going to mean anything. But realistically, this means that we need less IP addresses out in the public world to be able to bond multiple certificates to it and to be able to use multiple certificates on that one IP address. It just makes things consolidated, smoother operating, makes it easier to live with the whole op operation. And so, again, although it's not a huge thing that we're going to have a massive slide all about it in its own right, it's a very, very useful feature that's been baked into 11.1. Now, the, finally in there, there's some SSL enhancements. 
elliptical curve support on the MPX appliances, support for safe net hard hardware security modules, a number of other elements in there as well. So again, if SSL has been causing you some headaches, some encryption requirements that your organization has is causing you a couple of challenges, then go and dig around those SSL enhancements in the release notes, which obviously are available on Citrix.com. There's lots and lots and lots of other things in there. So I want to really focus on some of the core messages. I want to focus on some of the core features and functionalities that really are floating the boat for a lot of the folks that we're talking to. So if we first and foremost just take a look at the NetScaler Management and Analytics System, this is being referred to as NetScaler Mass. Now, for those who are familiar, uh, this is really quite a paradigm shift. And, and uh, honestly, I kind of think this is massive. Uh, okay, tongue in cheek. All right, I get that. But uh, having the ability to, well, okay, let me explain what it does. NetScaler Management and Analytics System is a single console that gives us the ability to view, to automate, and to manage network services from a single pane of glass. Now, we say that very quickly, and we think about the ways that we can possibly go around doing that now. But if you're one of those kinds of organizations that's constantly bouncing in and out of management consoles, um, time out, and so username and password, analytics, username and password, some more management overhead uh, control and uh, a control plane and management um, monitoring, bouncing in and out, in and out, in and out. There's all this disjointed mechanism of how you go about your day. So if you're familiar with the command center, which Citrix have had in production for many years now, the managing uh, management and monitoring solution, this allows us to have some control over our NetScaler appliances, both in their ADC functionality and in the WAN optimization functionality. And so we have a single point of control to be able to understand what's going on in there. And with a significant amount of control to be able to do things like patch updates, perhaps SSL certificate management and so on. Command Center has been free for a long time. It is available as a standalone hardware appliance if you need that sort of thing. But from a virtual appliance perspective, if you have a NetScaler, then you have entitlement to Command Center. If you have one or two NetScalers, it may be overkill. If you have a number of NetScalers, and then you're also looking at adding in some of the SD-WAN capabilities, which we'll come into in a little while, then Command Center really gives you that single point of aggregation to just make life easy. So again, it's something that's worth investigating. And it's one of those things that a lot of folks didn't really realize they have available to them. And so when we speak to them and deploy it, it's a bit of a paradigm shift. It makes life easy. Now, Insight Center introduced a couple of major firmware releases ago, but Insight Center has really, really stirred things up for a lot of organizations. It's deep, deep, deep level service visibility at a very, very granular level, getting right down into the guts of the service delivery chain to understand where the delays are coming from, to understand what the challenges are in hitting those SLAs for our customers. This could be things like the server response time, the WAN latency, the, the data center latency. So Insight Center has been a really useful tool for those both in a web-centric environment, or if the license keys allow you in a platinum edition for ZenApp and Zen Desktop, then Insight Center gives you some absolute gold dust metrics to be able to manage and control your user experiences and to be able to proactively do that rather than just reactively do that. So Insight Center has been a hugely popular uh, function that came in a couple of uh, releases ago. There's been some amendments along the way. And similarly, this control center, which although, and, and these are spelled ER because these are product names, uh, you know, for those who are, uh, I've already got somebody in the question bar saying that you spelt it wrong. Thank you for that. But the control center here, control center is really about cloud orchestration, how we manage the automation of workloads. And all of these products are available today. They're still fully supported. But the concept behind these is that there are three individual platforms that we've got to go into, three individual management consoles, and where we were looking to mitigate that challenge around the effort involved in looking after our environments, then there's clearly a better way of doing it. But there's another little thing in the background here that we need to be conscious about, and it's something called bimodal IT. Now, I fully appreciate this isn't going to be particularly relevant for some, and it'll be very, very relevant for others, but just bear with me because this is relevant in some ways to where we're going next. So, Bimodal IT, according to Gartner, everybody's favorite friend Gartner, allows the IT organization to respond to the digital divide within their organization by operating in two distinct modes that are comprehensive and coherent, but deeply different while exploiting the benefits of both. What? So let's put that into real words. Okay. Mode one, 
So in a traditional IT sense, I've got my exchange services. Maybe I've got SharePoint. Maybe I've got my CRM systems. Maybe I've got other operational devices and solutions and services that run on a daily basis. Everybody uses them. It's completely uh, unanimous across the organization, or at least very, very significant subsets of the organization. So this requires some due diligence. It requires some planning. It requires some network thought process. It requires services to be delivered onto relevant tin that's capable of delivering. So there's a lot of work that goes into the planning. There's meticulous verification that goes in there. And subsequently, while that's a good thing to make sure the service levels are where they need to be when that service comes online, it similarly just starts to slow down the actual delivery process. Not a huge issue, not a huge environment changer for a lot of organizations because we can plan around that. But there is another side to many organizations where they're looking to be a little bit more agile, where the innovation that they're looking to deliver potentially through uh, new services for mobile users or perhaps your customer base or your clients or those or those folks that are joining your organization's website and expecting wonderful things or there's mobile apps of course those kinds of services the developers really want to be able to bring those online very very quickly they have, they see a need they develop a solution to deliver that need and then they come over to the IT guys and the services team and the operations team and say, OK, we need to manage this and we need to deliver this out to our customers. The challenge always comes then that the developer has written the code in a certain way, but the operational side has some constraints around security or around traffic management or around the ability to pass the IP address of a an endpoint through to the developer's uh, wonderful new service. All these things start to get a little bit tricky and it slows the whole process down. And generally it uh, ends up with some arguments about what can and can't be done. And the developers say, I must have, and the operations guys say, you can't. And it really gets quite tricky in a lot of organizations. We see this quite commonly, uh, both with business to business, business to consumer, and indeed from some of the larger enterprise organizations that we deal with who are looking to deliver these new kind of innovation services just to help their teams go about their day in a more effective manner. So these two very distinct modes, mode one being the traditional sense, mode two being that more uh, agile DevOps type of environment, have historically always re 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 required, the word was required, have historically required uh, two very distinct methods of operation within the organization. So let's break these down and look at NetScaler management and analytics system and how that will support those kind of requirements. So first and foremost, mode one. Well, in that traditional IT sense, there's probably every organization has at least some of this. It's a centralized configuration using a new style books. Now, these are created and configured across an inventory of NetScaler instances. So what this means effectively is we can write a little bit of uh, code into that style book and have a drag and drop kind of menu creativity so that the developers can then start to, uh, oh, apologies, not the developers, but as an organization, we have some functions that we know we're going to need to do. We know we're going to need to load balance or provide HTTPS offload. And so these can be done with a simple style book mechanism to make it much easier to manage your Netscaler instances on a daily basis. And just as I said about previously with Command Center, the centralized SSL certificate management is clearly a good thing. Having all of those in one place and being able to roll out those new SSL certificates and have your alerting and mechanisms in there for when those are going to expire all in one place, it's all in that same console. Now, if we add on to that automated software upgrades, so think about maybe a HA pair of Netscalers and how you'd go about delivering an upgrade onto those today. So you crack open the HA pair, you probably upgrade the secondary, you test it, you verify it, you're happy with that, you migrate the traffic over, and then you're going to test uh, and, and make sure it's verified before you definitely go live and now you go live you're happy okay and now you've got your primary appliance and you go through the same process you upgrade and so on and then perhaps you flip them back over so the primary is now a primary again and so on having this whole process automated with provision for rolling upgrades to ha pairs completely eliminating downtime and reducing the operational overhead and inducing uh, a reduction in the operational risk is clearly a good thing as well uh, this is quite a nice little feature that's just going to make life easier for a lot of folks. And similarly, as we move through the list there, there's automated troubleshooting through the collection of data from all Netscaler instances, allowing you to identify trends of which individual uh, IP addresses, uh, service points of the IPs are failing to deliver and so on. Uh, bringing all this information into one place using logging and analytics from an application perspective rather than an appliance perspective is clearly a nice way to be able to manage those user SLAs. 
And similarly here as well, we're looking at micro segmentation and trusted networks. So again, where there's some compliance and where there's some risk associated with having multiple services being delivered uh, out of a single infrastructure, and then ensuring that we're able to create strong boundaries between the apps and services. So only the apps that are allowed to communicate with each other are allowed to do so, again, is clearly a good thing. As we move through then into multiple accentric views with read write privileges to accommodate different audiences, the, what this really means is having a single management console is a great idea, but we don't necessarily want everybody to be able to see everything. So we can give our individual users their own view. And this could be down to business level. So maybe the marketing team want to understand how much traffic has been hit by a website on a particular day after a marketing campaign has run. We can give them that visibility, but not allow them to have any control over the actual load balancing and the security elements of the environment. And similarly, we might have a security team that we want to be able to manage the SSL certificates and look after a compliance re uh, regulations and so on, but not be in a position where those individuals are able to make some traffic management uh, adjustments and so on. So, you know, being able to lock that lot, lot, little lot down is, is quite a nice thing. But something else that we're starting to see on a fairly regular basis now is this, um, this, this hybrid cloud support. So where we're starting to see the on-premise data center being used in conjunction with a third party's co-location or hybrid cloud type of model, this ability from Netscaler Mass to be able to control all of those Netscaler instances, regardless of their physical location, clearly brings some control back into this whole solution. So a single pane of glass, wherever your Netscaler instances are, regardless of where they are in whose cloud, if you've got management access to it, they all appear in that one place. And this can be up to 10,000 by the back end of this year. So quite a scalable solution in many instances. OK, so that kind of takes us in from the uh, management and analytics for the single mode one, but single mode two, uh, let's little look at that and how that sort of differentiates itself in their environment. We're talking about these guys with DevOps and they need to be agile and they need to be able to respond a lot quicker to these uh, requirements and challenges that are thrown up against us. So in this instance, first and foremost, remember I mentioned about the style books. Well, the first instance here, style books, uh, can be used quite easily by the developers. And let me explain further. So applications drive the infrastructure, right? So we've always had this thing where app and the network exists to serve the application. Uh, but when the applications are changing and fluid and frequently, uh, then the network has always been the slow bit of delivering those. So if we use something like management and analytics system, the infrastructure becomes a pool of resources that can be programmed to fit the different types of apps and use cases. So this in turn offers developers the ability to easily program a Netscaler instance uh, as part of the application development process without the need for Netscaler configuration knowledge. And this is using Stylebooks as well. So where we're then in a position to be able to take a drag and drop, I need to load balance. I need to do SSL offload. I need to pass the client IP address through to the back end server for the purpose of the actual application. It gives the developers the ability to do this in a micro sense environment without obviously having impact on the rest of the environment. And there's some additional little bits and pieces that are going to be relevant for those coming up in a couple of uh, a couple of clicks time. Now, as the pooled resources become the Netscaler instances that are abstracted uh, from the whole TIN environment, there, this allows them to become a part of a pool of resources that is available for any application. So where I've got spare Netscaler capacity, I can use that for any application in theory, if the logic of the architecture allows. And this in turn supports the ability to move any app to any available Netscaler to spin up or to scale down uh, on demand. Uh, is super agile. This is a really nice way of doing things. And so obviously some of the big hybrid cloud types environments have been going down this route for some time. Uh, but in the uh, in this instance, being able to do these things in our smaller environments and locally, uh, then, then clearly this becomes more affordable. It's, a, it's an interesting way of working about things. But if you think about it really as being able to respond to the demand in your environment at the time from a user perspective, more users spin up more resource. As the users go away, take that resource offline. It allows us to work super agile, but more importantly, more efficiently. So that tin isn't sat dormant, burning electricity, waiting for something to do. It's always busy and there's just less of it at the quiet times. Uh, back into trusted networks and micro segmentation just as before to separate those pre-production development and production traffic. So we want to make sure we reduce the security risk and uh, reducing that internal app to app DDoS threat. So this is probably even borderlining onto APIs and the, and the Internet of Things. 
having these internal applications that are talking to one another, we need to make sure that there's a method to be able to restrict uh, the risk of threat between those apps, a business to business or a machine to machine type of threat. And similarly, Mass is in a good position to help us do that. So service discovery then allows us to have our applications spun up in a dynamic environment to find and communicate with each other effectively to support the business processes and workflows. So again, it's less about that interaction between the applications from a networking perspective, and it's just programmatic from a logic perspective. So that again is going to help with that rollout, help with that uh, management on a daily basis logging and data management of very large instances. So at the moment, we're able to support a thousand instances, but moving through to 10,000 instances uh, by the end of this year. Uh, and the analysis of performance metrics for developers, architects, and business managers, and troubleshooting with a high degree of automation to allow network operators to manage this vast number of Netscaler instances. Because frankly, if you had a couple of thousand of these things kicking about, then, then that's, that's going to be quite challenging. So how the whole lot is glued together from a mode one and a mode two perspective is quite a relevant piece that folks are uh, starting to get a little bit excited about. Now, if we try and paraphrase all that lot down as the key takeaways, Netscaler Management and Analytics System is the only Mode 1 and Mode 2 management stack for ADCs on the market. It allows integration with data center orchestration for load balancing software, of which there are competitors, but also for hardware, for cloud, and for container, both ADC and from their software defined uh, WAN solution. So, it also solves the challenge of data aggregation and reporting at scale across multiple devices and multiple clouds. It provides an app-centric management that transparently maps the apps to the infrastructure and vice versa. So again, these operational use cases are quite relevant for some, maybe less for others, but I start to see perhaps pretty much every organization I think that we speak to could use this in some way, shape or form. Now, from a business perspective, it allows a more agile application infrastructure with the ability to support both mode one and mode two, the ability to deploy new application architectures that support the business objectives through integration with orchestration systems and uh, being able to come into line with our friends over at Puppet and Chef and OpenStack and all those kinds of things. You can start to see how this becomes quite a powerful operational tool uh, and ultimately allows us to cost save throughout the standardization and automation of appliance and application services delivered across multiple devices but from one single console and similarly from an administrator point of view increasing the user productivity uh, through increased ad, uh, app performance and uptime made possible by having better analytics and insights. So the guys that are actually responsible for making sure that that service level is maintained have that information to hand all from one console. And from an IT perspective, the ability to manage and scale out microservices application architectures by having a view and a control over the entire application architecture from that one pane of glass, I, I see you probably guess where I'm going with this. The ability to span the traditional IT and DevOps practices through automation and integration with SDN and cloud systems, better application performance and uptime delivered by insights into the connection performance across the network services path, increasing the agility by being able to propagate policies and services across physical and virtual container environments and more effective troubleshooting and better security protection through real-time insights across the application services infrastructure. So all of these things combined are quite, quite relevant. Now they start from zero cost to this Netscaler management and analytics system, but Citrix have just released pricing. If you'd like to reach out to us, if you'd like to know more about it, give me a nudge and uh, just drop into the clouddnagroup.com website and, uh, and drop us a, a note through there and I'll fill in the blanks for you and let you understand how that pricing model works. Now, We've spoken a little bit here about that traditional mode one. And if you take a little peek at how Netscaler is stacked up at the moment as, a, as an appliance offering, we can start very simply with the MPX. This is our old school friend, a single Netscaler instance on a single physical piece of tin. The SDX kind of sits in there as well as a physical piece of Netscaler tin, but with a virtual architecture inside to support up to 120 individual virtual Netscalers on that one physical chassis. So it's a consolidation of workloads in there. The VPX is very familiar for many folks. This is our virtual Netscaler appliance. And because Netscaler works in a software first mechanism rather than being 
uh, chip specific uh, uh, as a hardware solution. Because we're doing software first or a software approach to networking, the virtual appliance gives you practical um, feature parity with your physical uh, cousins. Uh, application firewall as proving very very popular being able to take that layer 7 control and uh, and security into a net scalar chassis you know, where the use case is sufficient enough that's available as a standalone the t-series out for our telco friends the gateway is a standalone device to be able to provide gateway services and of course the sd-wan solution which is huge at the moment and have a look at the uh, the uh, Cloud DNA essential guide for net scalar sd-wan if you need to be a little bit more familiar with that but there is a new kid on the block Oh, and if I hit that button there, that'll help us find him. There he is. So this is the CPX appliance. And this is quite specific to a certain set of use cases. But there are other instances. It could be used in the traditional enterprise, uh, but it's probably aimed fairly, fairly heavily towards the uh, the developer stack. So let's just take a little moment just to have a look at that. Netscaler CPX, the new kid on the block. So if we go back into our mode two idea of having innovation and DevOps and the need to be agile, and uh, particularly around our, our Docker friends, Carting chunky application delivery controllers around your cloud is not a good way to work. So the concept behind the Netscaler CPX is a very, very lightweight Netscaler appliance. There's no GUI on it. It's designed to be managed either by the mass system or it's designed to be managed uh, by an API. Uh, so in, for integration into your cloud orchestration. Uh, so CPX then becomes a very, very lightweight image that can be sat in a container with an application. And our DevOps guys can actually then build the application with that CPX appliance in that container. They can test it. They can verify it does the things they want it to do. They can make sure that all of those criteria for that application to be deemed a success are ticked off. And this is the super agile bit that we were speaking to before. Instead of then having the usual arguments with the operations team about what can and can't be achieved and how they're going to have to strip some of the functionality out of this super funky new uh, application or service because the network can't support that requirement, we know from scratch. The Docker guys and the developers have been able to deliver this CPX image with the style books to be delivered specifically for the application. And, from, and once they're happy with that, then the whole thing can be passed over into the cloud side of things, into the operational side of things as a complete container. So Netscaler CPX allows us to get that super agile kind of mentality. It allows the developers to be able to get on with their day. It allows us to bring those services online an awful lot quicker. And we've still got function parity with the rest of the Netscaler stack. Now, at the moment, again, this is early doors for this. So you'll forgive the guys at Citrix for not having the app firewall on the routing in there at this stage. But otherwise, it's a platinum edition appliance with up to a gig of throughput on each of those CPX instances. And if you want to be able to have a look at the pricing of that then again reach out we'll give you some information about how that stacks up uh, for your organization so netscaler cpx if you're devops if you're that kind of organization uh, really worth having a look at that but let's go back into a more traditional kind of enterprise environment Gateway has been always one of the key features in Netscaler. The ability to provide a secure front door into our environment for our remote users and indeed for those who are sat in other parts of the business, wherever they may be. Unified Gateway came out a little while ago, a year or so ago now. And this provides us with a single point of aggregation and a single point of access for our web software as a service, Zenapp, Zen desktop, mobile, or potentially any other services that you need to authenticate into. It gives users a single point of access, which is clearly a good thing. It gives the IT administrator a single point to be able to give users access. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, historically, if you've got services on site and you've got services coming from a software as a service provider, it's probably likely that the SaaS side of things is starting to get a bit tricky to manage. How many users are accessing? What are they doing when they're getting in there? When a user leaves the organization, how quickly can we take away their access privileges from all of the different services that are being delivered to them to, to help them go about their day when they work for us? Having that single point of aggregation is a single point to provision and to deprovision users when they leave the organization. It's a single point of audit. So Unified Gateway has been a really key feature for a lot of folks over the, car, the past year or so. And this is really gaining some momentum in those production environments that we've been playing around with. As we move into Netscaler 11.1, there's some additional functionality that's been baked into here. Again, Citrix, listen to what the challenges are and, uh, and find additional ways of adding value to this. So from our single point of access, 
we're now able to uh, provide a single point of aggregation for our apps and services. It's very similar to the logon to the receiver and storefront, if you're familiar for that. Now, I've uh, got a little image to share with you in a moment with that. The user configured RDP proxy link. So we can now provide a secure RDP uh, point of access uh, with or without a tunnel. Uh, and to be able to provide single sign-on to, ser to services, including RDP servers throughout the Netscaler gateway, it, there is an option to, de de to disable the single sign-on if required. And similarly, we'll be able to enforce smart access where Netscaler administrators can disable certain RDP capabilities through the Netscaler gateway configuration. Uh, and uh, for those who just want to have a little peek at that, for those on the slides and not want listening to the podcast of this, uh, then we're able to also provide a, a single point of aggregation for that user services. Now, it says storefront on it, and, and there's good reason for that, because there's parity between the storefront and what we're able to deliver now from this new user experience of the gateway. So when the user accesses the gateway, they get presented with a screen with their favorites, with their bookmarks, with their desktops, with their apps, regardless of whether those services have been del delivered by their organization or coming in as web or software as a service applications or indeed in the coming in as mobile applications onto their devices as well. Having all of that in one place, single point to log on, single point to log out, all the rest of it makes the user experience super quick, makes it really easy, reduces the support calls, makes everybody's life a lot easier. Let's be fair about it. This is a great idea. Uh, there is a little bit of a risk associated, though. So having all of the crown jewels in one place means that the risks associated with data loss or perhaps there are some concerns around compliancy, we need to increase that level of authentication and level of, uh, of capability around the security element. So good place to introduce n-factor authentication. And this has been around for a little while, but again, first generation has been at about, and now into a full release of 11.1, we're starting to see more capability in here. And what does it mean? Well, I take a standard kind of instance where uh, we have a traditional Citrix client, a browser or receiver, using the Active Directory password as the first password field as the username comes in. Username, first password. The second password is usually reserved for the one-time password stuff, so the uh, the PIN number, uh, often, not always. Uh, however, in order to secure AD servers, it's often that the, the one-time password is required to be validated first. So N-Factor allows us to do this without requiring client, client modifications. We can do a multi-tenant authentication endpoint. So some organizations use different gateway services for certificate and non-certificate users. Um, so in other words, those who are using a trusted device and those who are coming in perhaps from a contractor or coming in from a personal device. And with users using their own devices to log in, users' access levels may need to be restricted. We're not entirely sure that we're happy for that corporate data to go onto a user's device. And subsequently from there, we're able to use this n-factor authentication. Uh, to vary the level of access that that user can have. And the gateway then can cater for different authentication needs. This could be going around through the base of AD groups. So some organizations don't, uh, or some organizations will obtain user properties from their AD service to determine their authentication requirements. And so again, authentication requirements can be varied for different users. So we can set up a set of profiles for users on the authentication state and we can then allow the AD credentials and the AD grouping of that user to determine which one of those authentication mechanisms is going to be used. So again, we may have higher risk and lower risk users, or we may have some authentication cofactors. So in other words, we might want to be in a position where we have different types of policies or different pairs of policies that are used to authenticate different sets of users. So this is effectively adding a schema in there and saying if the user is coming from a corporate device and they're coming from the networker that is trusted, the Wi-Fi in the, in the office, then we're going to let them work on just username and password. If that same user is coming in from a trusted device, but they're coming in over a network that we don't recognize, we're going to add in the one-time password as well. Or we're going to say if they're coming in with their untrusted device from an untrusted network, well, we're going to put a human challenge in there as well. Uh, so I am not a robot, etc. So having this cascading level of authentication cofactors means you can really take every single different type of user access scenario into place. And you could even be in a position where you say once that user's come in from a particular set of circumstances, then we're only going to allow them to check out their email or something similar. The choice is yours, and that's the key with it. It's a very, very flexible way to be able to nail down those authentication requirements to stop data loss, to stop those users taking things that they shouldn't be taking, 
and to keep in control of the whole operation from a, a, an IT perspective, having that ability to audit, et cetera. Now, that really then starts to say, okay, with all that level of complexity that's available to us, actually managing that and, and working around authentication failures starts to get a wee bit tricky. So the gateway insight feature really comes in quite neatly there. Remember, I spoke about Insight Center a little while ago, and this is baked into the management and analytics system as well. As a user's coming in to authenticate, what typically happens if that fails? Now, if they've forgotten their password, then the support guy gets that straight in the neck straight away. But if the user can't get on for other reasons, it can start to get a little bit tricky to understand what's going on. So does the user have a password problem? Is there a single sign-on issue? Has the endpoint scan failed? So in other words, we're checking out which that endpoint is and making sure that it has perhaps the right level of antivirus before we let it on the network. How has the client connected over what network and which applications in particular are having authentication issues? And this is very relevant if we're going to use Unified Gateway and we're going to be delivering services from various different sources, both in the cloud and both on premises. And as a result of that, we can, might find that we're having authentication issues in maybe the software as a service solution stuff that's using SAML, but the stuff that's on site is not necessarily having the same challenges. How do you know that in your environment today? Well, Gateway Insight as an addition to our Insight Center and to Mass allows us to be able to dig down into visibility into errors and EPA methods, uh, endpoint analysis methods. It allows us to troubleshoot user authentication errors. It allows us to take single sign-on issues and drill down into those and understand exactly where that error lies so that we can immediately find out the core, root cause of the problem and do something to remediate. And similarly, in the background there as well, troubleshoot application launch issues within HDX sessions. So this could even be right down inside the guts of a ZenApp or Zen desktop environment that a user goes to open a particular application, and they now have the visibility of why that thing has failed. So again, if you're looking after these on a daily basis, either through the Insight Center or through the management and analytics system, there's a great sense of, uh, of relief for a lot of the guys that we're working with in production environments that this is giving them yet more information to make educated decisions about what to do next when the support call comes in. And similarly, if you're using Insight Center to deliver web services, you may well be using the integrated cache on the NetScaler to do that in Platinum Edition. Well, now Web, web Insight includes the integrated cache metrics, so we can see how many times that cache has been hit and so on. And, uh, and if well, there are failures in there or if there is a restriction in there that's causing further challenges. So again, nice to have kind of features that are being baked in and just slipped in under the radar and you could get missed under the headlines of all this other wonderful stuff that's going in. Now, NetScaler is very, very competent in the telco marketplace. It has the ability to scale significantly very, very large environments to be able to take many terabytes of data in a single hit uh, in, uh, in real term flow. There are a huge amount of con uh, configuration elements that need to be considered for telco environments and Citrix over the last few years have spent some time really polishing that lot up and you can even see obviously with the T grade appliances that were in there per uh, earlier in their slide deck the telco is very serious for them. Now while this is not necessarily relevant for a lot of folks there are some elements of telco traffic management, which will be relevant. Um, so as network traffic today becomes more diverse and bandwidth intensive than ever before, with increasing traffic, the effect that the quality of service has on TCP performance is significant. Um, so the quality of service side of things, the limitations within a, a fixed capacity of, of network and uh, uh, space is something we can go into in many details with many folks if you find that's a relevant conversation to go with. But to really paraphrase the whole lot down, when users are coming in from different types of networks, whether that's 3G, 4G, they're coming in on the LAN or they're coming in on the wide area network, the way that TCP as a delivery mechanism functions, a transmission control protocol, which has always been a bit clunky at the best of times, the way that that functions across those different types of network is different. And so we need to try and find ways of being able to configure uh, some kind of mechanism in place that recognizes how that network performs, LAN versus 4G, discuss, okay, and then being able to provide some TCP profiles to polish up the TCP mechanism with new introductions like hybrid high start to avoid uh, congestion without causing heavy packet loss during the slow start transmission periods for TCP, or to deliver TCP fast open, uh, to uh, open successive TCP connections between two endpoints in a much, much speedier fashion. 
Uh, these kind of things are relevant, and we add them to BIC and Cubic and Westwood and all the other component uh, TCP optimizations that we've been uh, adding to in the Netscaler stack for some years. So it allows us to really nail down the service and genuinely give the very, very best service performance to every single user, regardless of what type of network, what type of device they come in over. So included in that or as an extension to that, particularly for the mobile carrier uh, uh, networks, mobile station integrated subscriber directory numbers, MSISDNs, uh, it's a telephone number that uniquely identifies a subscriber across multiple networks. So being able to pass that information across those multiple networks allows those uh, that are responsible for delivering the services to understand if a user is able to consume those services. Who is that user? What are they using? Do we make sure they've got the right bill? Do they have access privileges, et cetera? And similarly at the back end here, when you're getting into, into very large scale network address translation, uh, many of these uh, ISP subscriber applications must be accessible from the internet. So for example, the internet of things or IOT devices. Um, this could be an IP camera, maybe, that provides surveillance over the internet and you can view it on your phone. So for very large numbers of subscribers, creating static large-scale number NAP maps is not really a feasible option. PCP, however, enables a subscriber to request a, significant, a specific LSN NAP mappings for itself and or other third-party devices. So in other words, what we're doing here is really simplifying the process of the adoption of the Internet of Things and other uh, drivers and allowing those poor old administrators in these type of environments to have some control over that without completely swamping them with a huge, huge number of, of configurations that need to be uh, addressed. So really, that gives you a really good snapshot about what's going on with Netscaler 11.1 at the moment. We are going to have specific uh, uh, essential guides around the Unified Gateway and around some of the other topics. And if you'd like a specific topic to be investigated further, then drop us a line at Cloud DNA or bounce us a, a tweet on Twitter at Cloud DNA, and we'll fill in some of the blanks for you from there. Netscaler 11 continues to develop on Netscaler's heritage, and this is an 18-year-old platform now to make sure that our services are available, that they are secure, that they are, uh, offer the best possible user experience with the scale and efficiency that means that we can actually manage to keep on top of the budget and costs associated with that. So Netscaler 11 allows us to deliver all those kinds of things in a wonderful and coherent way. And by all means, reach out, ask us some questions, get involved, give us a call, jump on the website or visit us and follow us at Cloud DNA, where we are pretty much on there every day, bringing out some new little bit of information, something we've learned or something that we'd like to share with you. Give us some feedback. Let me know what you want to have a little bit more of a dig around on, and we'll fill in the blanks for many of these bits and pieces. But otherwise, I really appreciate your time. I know we're all busy. Uh, this will be being distributed as a recording, so I'll, I'll uh, send you all the link to that so you can share it with your colleagues. Uh, but for the rest of it enjoy the rest of your friday and have a great weekend thanks a lot for your time uh, my name is al from cloud dna cheers now bye bye